Today, President Trump made sure that there were no questions about Bill O'Reilly at his press conference. He did that by giving the first question to... Take a few questions. Uh, John Roberts of Fox, please. Mr. President, thanks so much. The next reporter Donald Trump called on was from The Hill, and so, of course, that reporter asked a procedural question about legislation in Congress next week, which is The Hill's beat. And the Italian prime minister called on two foreign reporters who've never heard of Bill O'Reilly. Well, okay, one of them has heard of Bill O'Reilly because she works for a Rupert Murdoch operation. So we are still waiting for the admitted, the admitted sexual harasser and sexual assaulter who is the President of the United States, to comment on his best friend, no longer in the news media, Bill O'Reilly, who even the protective Rupert Murdoch and Fox News finally found indefensible. Yesterday, Rupert Murdoch and his sons and his company gave up in their 13th year of publicly defending Bill O'Reilly against accusations of sexual harassment. It has been an expensive run for O'Reilly and for Fox News. The New York Times reports tonight that payouts related to sexual harassment allegations at Fox News now total more than $85 million. The vast majority of that, up to $65 million in exit packages, is being paid to the men who were ousted from the network because of the harassment allegations. Former Fox News chairman Roger Ailes got a $40 million gift as he was ushered out the door last year after being exposed for his constant, relentless sexual harassment at Fox News with several women, including episodes that were far, far worse than sexual harassment. Bill O'Reilly picked up $25 million today on his way out the door, according to the New York Times. That was the agreed upon amount in Bill O'Reilly's new contract. If he were to get fired, the contract provided that he would get one year's salary, which for him is $25 million. It has come to this because women persisted. Starting with Andrea Macris in 2004, she obtained a $9 million settlement against Bill O'Reilly for sexual harassment. Also complaining about Bill O'Reilly's sexual harassment over the years were Rachel Whitlieb, Ber Rachel Whitlieb Bernstein, Rebecca Gomez Diamond, Lori Dew, Juliet Huddy, and Andrea Tenteros. And then there was Wendy Walsh, who was able to fully tell her story in the front page New York Times investigative piece 19 days ago that began the new wave of O'Reilly accusers and what turned out to be the final chapter of Bill O'Reilly's life as a sexual harasser at Fox News. Wendy Walsh and the other two women you will meet tonight did not sue Bill O'Reilly, so Wendy Walsh was not legally prevented from speaking about her experience, as are the women who have obtained those financial settlements from O'Reilly. All of those settlements include a provision that makes, that, that makes it legally impossible for the women to speak. Of the at least $85 million that Fox News has paid out in sexual harassment costs, not one penny of that has gone to any of the three women who are joining us tonight who had the misfortune of encountering Bill O'Reilly at Fox News. Joining us now, Perkita Burgess, Caroline Heldman, and Wendy Walsh. They're joined by their attorney, Lisa Bloom. Uh, welcome all, and Perkita, I'd like to start with you because your story was the one that came out on, on what was the final day uh, of this controversy. It, came, it was the final story, which, uh, as Lisa and I have discussed, seemed like it was the one where Fox News decided we cannot take another day of this. Um, could you tell us what happened to you with Bill O'Reilly at Fox News? Um, my tenure at Fox News began um, as a, tempor a temporary employee um, through an agency with one of his colleagues. And, he, you know, I did not interact with him. He was not in my department, so to speak. And, you know, I just started the job very innocently, um, you know, expecting to work with the person that I worked for. I was there maybe a week and a half, a couple of weeks. Um, I would see him in the hallway. Um, my desk was in an open area. I would see him in the hallway and, you know, 
he would not say anything to me, but it wasn't expected, um, although other people spoke to me because of where I sat. I was trained by someone else before they left for their maternity leave. Um, so he saw me, I can't remember exactly how long she trained me, but once she left, um, and she did not, I don't, she never introduced me to him. Once she left, I was there by myself, solo, in, in that position. One day... Was it a normal traffic pattern for him to be passing by you? It wasn't normal because his crew was, like, to my left, mm -hmm. and then my manager's um, office was down that way. So if he went that way, it might, it was not every five seconds, but it may have been him going to visit someone or doing whatever. One day he walked past my desk and he made like a grunting sound, like, mm, like, mm, I, you know, I'm not a mm -hmm. man, so I can't do, do his voice. And when he did it, you know, I thought nothing of it. You know, I didn't know why he did it. You know, so I just like kind of paid it no, no attention. And since he walked past me, he never, he never spoke to me, which is, like I said, it, that was fine. So, you know, time went on. He did not even walk past me on a daily basis, um, so to speak, all the time, but at least once every few days or whatever. Time went on. The next time I saw him, I kind of, you know, you expectantly look at anyone just to, like, mm -hmm. give them a head nod or, you know, hi, hi, how are you? And he made the sound again. And every time he did it, it became more guttural, like mm -hmm. it was purposeful. Like, I want you to hear it. And then I, like I said earlier, you know, I thought maybe it was a nervous tick, something. But I always, I would not understand why he did it when I was, like, always by myself and no one was around. It, it sounded purposeful. I've heard people make that sound before, whether, you know, it was in a movie, whatever, TV show. So it, it bothered me because it seemed as if it were directed towards me in a, a communicative tone. Like, you know, I mm -hmm. want to communicate with you with my growls. <laughs> mm -hmm. So... Um, and then something happened in the elevator. Yes. So fast forward a few weeks. I don't remember the exact time. I didn't document it. Um, I was in the elevator alone with him. And we had gotten in there. Like, the lobby was kind of empty. So it's, you know, he and I were on going to the same floor. And as we, you know, went up the ele elevator, he did not say anything, which is fine. And I go to get off. And he, you know, behaved as if, you know, I'm letting you out in front of me, mm -hmm. which he did. And as I was walking out the elevator, he said, looking good there, girl. And as I kept walking, you know, I, <laughs> my natural instinct was to turn around and say, you know, don't talk to me like that. Um, as I kept walking, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. I was upset, pissed off, mm -hmm. <laughs> because I knew at that point he was hitting on me, whatever he wants to call it. I call it sexual harassment. Because, number one, you don't even acknowledge me in a hum humanistic way. Mm -hmm. And then you're making noises at me. And then you, you say, looking good there, girl. Girl is very degrading. It's like mm -hmm. calling a black man a boy. You know, I, I took it in a very offensive manner. Did, did, it, did you have a sense that this was his notion of how to communicate with black women? Did it oh, feel definitely. particular to a black woman? Definitely. Yeah. I keep using the word plantational because that's exactly how it felt. You know, I've, I've had all manner of men, you know, hit on me. I don't care. But there's a way that it can be done where there's a very racialistic tone. Mm -hmm. So on mm -hmm. top of degrading me with the noises, on top of calling me girl, a few weeks later, he comes by my desk and goes, hey there, hot chocolate. And I'm like, or hey, hot chocolate. He didn't say hey there. He said, hey, hot chocolate. Well, no one was around. He didn't look at me. He said it. In between some of those times, he's leering at me. He's standing around my desk. He has no business being there. And 
I got to a point where I ignored him. I would ignore, you know, him by just turning my back, making sure I did not even glance in his direction because I was so offended, mm -hmm. and I, I did not know what to do. Um, I didn't know if there was anything I could do, obviously. Did you talk to anyone about it? Any friends at Fox oh, News? Not at Fox News, no. Um, you were a temp working there, temp. so you didn't have a bunch of friends. There. I didn't have a bunch of friends. I knew people. Anybody warn you about them? At Fox News? Yeah. Or anyway. Oh. <laughs> a ton of people did. You mean um, people just on real, the outside who... It just in real, you know, people watch him, you know... And they just think he's a certain kind of guy. They, well, they didn't warn, warn me about him in a, uh, this, with the sexual harassment. They yeah. just said, you know, he's a bigot or whatever. Yeah. But I've worked with bigots before, you know, you just... Whatever. So... Um, but in terms of people who actually knew inside Fox News, no one mentioned anything to you? No one said, not that I can remember. That not that I can remember, but maybe they did. And, mm -hmm. you know, just in a casual manner, like, oh, whatever. You know, I, I don't remember, and I don't want to misremember. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I had already begun expressing the harassment to my friends and family. And it became um, repetitive. My best friend was like, you just, it, it, it escalated. Mm -hmm. You kept saying how upsetting it was, and it pissed you off because you can't say anything. You don't want to lose your job in a temporary position, and you don't want to ruin the relationship that your agency has fostered with the corporation. Mm -hmm. So I tried to handle it, I guess, professionally. Um, what I would see as professional, just let it roll off your back, which may work, you know, if you're dealing with a coworker that's difficult to deal with. But sexual harassment is not something that's difficult <laughs> to deal with. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard for me to deal with. It's traumatic. I'm still hurt by it. Having to conjure up these feelings to the world is it's traumatizing, and I'm not afraid of anything. Mm -hmm. But I was just like, this is horrible. It's horrible that someone has operated so long and hurt so many people in so many different ways. It's, it's, it's just an abuse of power, and it had to end. I want to, I want to get more of, of how your story became public, but I want to talk to Caroline uh, before we go to a break, and we'll come back after the break uh, with more. Uh, but Caroline, I wanted to get your story of, of your problems with Bill O'Reilly. So I worked at Fox. Uh, I was a regular guest on his show from 2008 until 2011, and I had been warned about him. Uh, I had been warned by numerous people that he uh, had engaged in sexual harassment with them. Um, but most of my hits were from afar. I was in L.A., he was in New York. But on the occasions where I met him in person, I felt like I needed to take a shower afterwards. Um, he undresses women with his eyes. Yeah. Um, he definitely did that to me. In fact, one of the first things he said, if not the first thing he said to me, was something to the effect of, when I was in college, professors didn't look like you, ha, ha, ha. Um, but really, the, the actionable, uh, thing that he did was December 14th, 2011. I've been doing his show as a regular guest um, and, in fact, was up to almost once a week on his show, sometimes more than once a week. And we were going at it, having a policy debate, you know, repartee, tit for tat, and I was arguing with him, as I always has had been for years, and all of a sudden, in the middle of it, he says, uh, Caroline, why are you being so hysterical? And I was taken aback. It's 2011. Why are you using the sexist term? So um, I felt I had an obligation to, you know, set him straight on that. And I said, look, Bill, that's a sexist term. You're being sexist. And he insisted that he would use it for a man. And I said, no, 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 no. It derives its meaning from, you know, it's a gendered term. Um, I don't know if I went into the technical details of it being a neurological disorder um, because you have uh, a vagina. Um, <laughs> But I didn't go into that level of detail, but I definitely put him in his place because he was being a sexist bully. And I didn't think much about it because we'd gone back and forth before a number of times. Uh, but this particular time when he aired it, he removed, he edited out that chunk, which tells me that he knows he did something wrong. And then he never called me mm -hmm. back. So because I called him on his sexist bullying, he ended my, uh, you know, blacklisted me from a show, um, which had profound effects on my media career. I was on an upward trajectory, and he put a huge roadblock in the way. And that's, you know, in, in my book, textbook gender discrimination. And retaliation. 
Yes. Uh, uh, Wendy, uh, we're going to get a break in here, but I just want to hear from you quickly before we do. Our, our audience has heard uh, the story of your encounter with Bill O'Reilly before. I, we will get some more details on it when we come back. But one of the things that I'm fascinated by is how long the New York Times was working on this story and the kind of work they did and what it took for Emily Steele, the reporter at the New York Times, to find you. Uh, what was your first encounter with the New York Times? Uh, was it Emily Steele calling you? Yes, Emily Steele sent me an email, and I have to say, this is a bootstrapping, hardcore investigative journalist who kept turning over stones and turning over stones until she turned over one, and there I was. What she did is went through past shows. She looked some, sometimes for a certain physical type because she was comparing them to the five other women who he had paid off. Um, and then she'd find that they would disappear from the show. They'd be there, and then they wouldn't be there. So she simply sent a polite email saying, I'm doing an investigation on sexual harassment at Fox News. Would you give me a call? And I thought, because I'm a psychologist and I do media commentary, that she wanted me to weigh in about the psychological damage of sexual harassment to women. So I pick up the phone and call her right away. And she said, I noticed you used to be on the O'Reilly Factor and now you're not. Would you care to share why? And at that moment, I had to make this ethical decision to lie and protect Mr. O'Reilly and Fox News or to tell the truth and risk who knows what. But I chose to tell the truth, but it took four months for her to get me to go on the record because I was just so afraid. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.